Okay, so before we go on to momentum and, and impulse, which is naturally related, uh, one more thing that I wanted to bring up with work and energy here, which um, I got too excited and that was a natural time to move on, but I did want to mention, we do define power. Now in this case, P stands for a couple things, but here power, capital P, um, we define power to be the, the um, well, there's two ways to equally well define it. Um, power is the, how quickly an object uses energy. In other words, how many joules does it consume per second? Or equivalently, because energy is the same as work, we can also define it as dW, dt. And what that means is instead of asking how many joules of energy does it consume per second, we can say how many joules of energy does it output per second. And typically, it's, it's, it's customary to kind of always assume that power will be a positive. Um, now, if you're dealing with the power of a motor versus the power of uh, an anti-motor, um, oh geez, um, it, it, there's actually a term for that, I can't think of it. Um, but it's, it's understood that whether you're, you're using energy from your surroundings or you're giving energy to your surroundings. Um, uh, a generator, <laughs> a motor uses ener energy, a generator creates energy, sorry. Um, but anyway, it's, it's assumed that you're taking the absolute value, so you can describe how much energy something is outputting or how much energy something consumes per time. Now, typically, th those two are the same thing if you're calculating them properly. Uh, but for example, like a 40 watt light bulb, uh, if you measure how much light energy is output, it's not 40 watts of light or it's not 40 joules of light per second. Um, because much of that energy that like a, a incandescent light bulb spits out actually goes in terms of heat. So, so the light energy might not be 40 joules of energy per second, but the total energy output will be the same as what the, the correct description of energy that it uses is. I hope that makes sense there. Okay, so um, with that said, um, the, the reason why I wanted to leave the left-hand side up when we talk about mo uh, momentum and impulse is that we're gonna see a lot of the same thing here. So I'm just gonna talk through this because again, you've all seen this before, but the way that we define momentum, first of all, is we say that the momentum of an object, uh, now the way I, I view it is, the way I describe it and think about it is, instead of talking about a velocity, which is how fast, I think of momentum as the true amount of actual motion. Not just how fast, but how much is going how fast. So obviously, uh, you know, a semi-truck going at 10 miles an hour has a lot more motion than a, a, a Prius going at 10 miles per hour. So we just simply multiply the mass times the velocity, and that is what we define as momentum. Now, the thing with this, though, is that we can now look back with a slightly different view of what Newton's, um, of Newton's second law said. As you recall, Newton's second law says that, and I'm going to write it in, in the standard form that you would see it, F equals ma. And now I'm going to drop again the vector notation because it's assumed all the vectors are vectors. Um, but, so this is what you hear in, in basic physics. And what you hear in basic physics is flat out wrong. Because that's not how Newton said it. The way Newton said it was, in fact, the force is equal to the derivative of momentum. Now, if you've seen this, I'm being a little bit overdramatic about it, but it's a cool connection to make if you haven't. So specifically, the reason why those two things are the same in some cases is this. If we replace this with the definition of momentum, this becomes dvt of mv. Now, what assumption do we make that allows us to say f equals ma? That assumption is if m is being constant. If m is constant, you can pull that out, and then this becomes m times dv dt, which is ma. But in the more general situation, if, for example, if you're a, um, you know, a, a, a car going, uh, sorry, I'm having to think here. If you are a train uh, uh, that you're going down the track and you're carrying, you know, like, let's say sand from point A to point B, but you have a slow leak of your sand. Like as you move forward, gradually your mass is decreasing because you're losing some of your payload as you move forwards. So in that case, your, the force 
that, that essentially is acting on you is going to be due to a change in mass and not to a change in velocity here. So if both things are allowed to change equally, you have to use the change rule and you only get this expression back when one of those two is constant. Um, this, by the way, turns into the, the, the rocket equation. For those of you studying, for example, air or astro engineering, you're going to look at this and you're going to allow both of these to vary simultaneously because as you lose rocket fuel, your mass goes down, but also your velocity goes up. So that's where things get fun. Um, so anyway, that's what the, the basic Newton's second law is in terms of actual uh, momentum and uh, 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 forces. And by the way, that's net force. Now, the way that we that we combat this here. And so I'm going to go back to this. Oops. Sorry, Lenny. Uh, that's I, my dog sitting next to me here. <laughs> um, and he gets scared when I <laughs> bang on walls and stuff. Uh, okay, so this equation here, and I'm going to get rid of this. Um, if we now, let's see, integrate this. Actually, first of all, let's, um, yeah, if we integrate this whole thing with respect to time. So I'm going to do an integral of this dt, this is messy notation, don't do this in homework sets, but I think you understand what this means here. Um, now, this will become the integral of f dt, and the right-hand side is the integral of dp dt dt, which that should set off red flags you right away. Um, so very clearly on the right-hand side, you should recognize this is where the fundamental theorem of uh, calculus comes in. Uh, now, it's assumed here that we're taking definite intervals. We're going from some finite initial time to some finite final time. So in this case here, if you do this, if you do this, uh, apply the fundamental theorem of calculus, this becomes the momentum, just P, evaluated at the final time minus the initial time. So what I'm saying here is, is just P from I to F. And that's really just simply delta P, your change in momentum. And now the left-hand side, this right here, we're not going to try to like, you know, simplify that any further. But instead, we're just going to give it a name. We're going to call it the impulse. And so the impulse, we the, the typical letter that you see written, and I really have no clue why it's written like that, is J. So the impulse here, and by the way, I'm going to rearrange this just a tad. The impulse, J, on the left-hand side, um, by the way, it's a vector because at all times the force is going to be a vector. So the resultant on the left-hand side will have a direction. And clearly on the right-hand side, momentum's a vector, so change of momentum must be a vector. That's my dog again here. Um, so this right here, the impulse that's applied equals the change in momentum. Do we see anything that looks like that on the board? Yeah. The work that's applied equals the change in energy. The impulse that's applied equals the change in momentum. Now, there's a difference here. This is a vector equation. This is a scalar equation. Um, and the way we define them is slightly differently. So let me, I just want to very clearly write this up in some, in a slightly suggestive fashion here. Um, I'm going to write out the definition of the impulse. And this is what we define here. And by the way, that was also a definition. Um, we define the impulse as the integral of force over time. Now, that's not a dot product. Time doesn't have a direct, well, time does have a direction, but it's not a vector. Um, and because of that, the whole right-hand side is a vector as well, though. And then we have J equals delta P. Okay, so um, in this, and if you want, we can write the definition MB. So basically, this is like four weeks worth of your last, uh, of your physics one semester right here all on two sheets. Um, but the right-hand side, this is super important because this is the impulse momentum principle. Whenever you do impulse onto an object, you change its momentum. Whenever you do work onto an object, you change its energy. See how they are directly similar, only just you tune the dial a little bit. You change specifically, if you're talking about force being applied over a given distance, you're doing work, you're changing energy. If you're talking about force being applied for a given time, 
you're doing impulse or you're providing impulse, you're changing that object's momentum. They are incredibly similar except that variable of integration there. Now, this is going to be really fun once we get to, well, we're not really going to see the, the full beauty of it this term, but turns out though when we create these four vectors, the, the energy four vector, um, which we will describe that a little bit towards the end of our uh, coverage of relativity, the energy four vector is actually going to be um, a, four a four directional, it, it's going to have four components. Um, the, the, the first three components are your momentum in the x, y, z, and the last component is your, mo your momentum in time, which is energy. Don't think too hard about that, and, and I'm taking a little bit of liberty in saying it how I did there. But these two things get combined into one cohesive fashion, which actually unifies this whole thing. That's one of the, beauty, one, one of the beauties of, of relativity. It combines so many seemingly disparate laws into one much more cohesive mathematical framework. Um, okay, and then the, the last thing that I want to say here. Now, notice when we were talking about energy, we said, okay, what if there are no forces? If we have an isolated system. We saw that if there are no external forces, the energy has to be conserved. Let's ask the same question again. What if we have an isolated system where forces from outside that system will never interact with the objects inside that system? Then in that case, you can never have any impulse provided from external to that system. So the total amount of momentum of that system will never change. Now, it's very possible inside that system, two, uh, two particles, uh, two air molecules, for example, can collide. They can exchange momentum. They can transfer momentum from one particle to another. But that can never happen from outside the system to in. So when you have an isolated system, when you take away any external force, that leads us to the law of conservation of momentum. External forces, sorry, um, um, any absence of external forces mean that whatever our total momentum is now will never change. Meaning that, and here's the same thing we did before, if we view the universe as our entire system, there is by definition nothing outside the universe. So there is nowhere for momentum to either spill out to or to be gained from elsewhere. So we know for very, very well, based on literally every experiment that's ever happened, the momentum of the entire universe is not changing. It's another fundamental law of the universe. Energy of isolated systems remains the same. Momentum remains the same. So these two things are incredibly fundamental to our view of the universe here. Now, uh, one last thing to mention about um, uh, using momentum specifically, this comes up almost exclusively, more, well not exclusively, but, but you're guaranteed to be talking about momenta transfer whenever there are collisions between two objects. Um, because now, and I'll, exp I'll explain the reason for that. Um, if you have a collision between two objects, they're applying a very high amount of force. Now, if generally speaking, if I just like very slowly kind of like, you know, drag my feet across the floor here, over a long extended period of time, I'm, I'm gliding my feet across the floor, there's friction. That friction is like gradually taking momentum away from me. You know, if I, if I had like, I don't know, if I had shoes and I took a running start here, and, or socks and I had a running start, I'd slide across the floor. As time went by, the friction would slow my momentum down and I would gradually come to a stop. So clearly in that, in that situation, momentum is not conserved because the floor, an external object, is taking my momentum away. But um, what's, what, what I wanna uh, say here though is that if you have a collision between, between two objects, the amount of time where they interact, the amount of time where they're able to apply a force onto each other is exceedingly small. And we typically view the time of collisions as essentially zero. So that even if they're applying a high amount of force, the, the Newton's third law implies there's a high amount of force being generated between the two objects, because the time that's, that, that that force interacting is so small, effectively, there's no time for the total momentum of the system to be lost due to non-conservative forces. I, I, I hope that makes sense. Uh, but if there's any sort of friction involved in the, in the situation, you, you're going to be losing momentum due to this non-conservative force. But over very short collisions, no, no momentum can be lost because that interaction happens so quickly. 
Now we could say the same thing for, for work. Uh, um, if, you, if you apply a force over an exceedingly small distance, that, you know, for example, if I try to push against this, I might be able to push this like, you know, a millionth of a meter this way. But effectively, I'm not pushing hard enough for, for the wall to be moving much at all. So my work in that case, if it's effectively not moving, is zero. Same with collisions. If it's exceedingly small time, you have zero transfer momentum. Okay, that's more than I wanted to say about that, but it's a different way of viewing it, I think, maybe than you see. Maybe it, maybe it isn't. Okay, so let's go on uh, to the, the last couple of things we need to talk about here for classical mechanics.